I am a private person, but I give a huge amount of, like I do reveal a huge amount of myself in, mm. in, in the songs and in the work, in, the, in an interview like this, you know. Most people don't, <laughs> most people don't sit down, you know, around me and do a chat, you know what I mean, talk about themselves. Hi, I'm Nick, and I'm joined by Hosea for the latest in Enemies in Conversation series. How's it going today? Yeah, good, good. Thanks, Nick. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Of course. First thing I wanted to ask is, what's the significance of the album title, Unreal Unearth? Where did that kind of come from? Yeah, I was just playing with, um, like, Unearth as, as, as sort of our world that seems sort of unreal or, or surreal, you know, um, not like itself, as sort of an unearth, but then unearth to dig and uncover and, and reveal. Um, and yeah, so it, it was just playing with this, playing with that, I guess. And it, I think I started writing the album early parts of the sort of pandemic period, the sort of lockdown period, just felt like we were stepping into a new, a new type of world. And um, it was kind of surreal and, and misinformation was big at the time and stuff like that. So yeah, it was like, it was playing with this sort of, this new, stepping into a new space, a new world and and then also just playful, un unearth as verb as well as noun, I guess. You, know. you said it's uh, an eclectic album. Did you kind of, at the start, think, I don't want to put any barriers on where I go with this album, or is it, did it just kind of happen organically that it became eclectic? I think it, I think it happened organically. Um, I knew there were certain sounds that I wanted to explore, there were certain sort of textures I wanted to explore. Um, but part of... Try, trying to trying to create the album in this kind of lockdown period as well too was was collaborating sometimes at a dif distance collaborating with producers remotely and then doing sessions when I could and as I could as well too it, at a time where somebody somebody might might you know might have to quarantine and then another person might have to quarantine and so um, it, it, it that also probably allowed for this allowing one song to be itself and, and but it Part of the idea too, in separating the song into circles, was was allowing one song and in its theme to be itself and, and and explore that, knowing that the next circle can be something slightly different. So, there was a, it was a, a conscious decision to just let songs be themselves as well. You know, so it just worked out. You spoke about the way the collaborations panned out. You've co-written a lot more on this album than mm. in the past. Mm -hmm. What made you want to do that, and did you enjoy that process? I did. I did. I enjoyed it. I think. I'd never sort of co-written with with uh, with people, in te you know, before in that in that way. So to just be in a space with musicians and jam—that was a lot of how this music started. What the, how these sort of soundscapes were made, in particular with the, the songs with Dan, with Bacon, with Dan Tenenbaum and and, and his team with Pete Gonzalez and, and Chakra. Um, it was like we would just jam. We would just make noise. And then see what would happen. We'd record that noise, and I would take the sessions or take some stems away, and, and and then build a song around it. Sometimes, and I wrote a lot of the work that I that I needed to on my own, which is how I'd done the, the previous two albums. Was it quite scary to relinquish control in that way at the start? I think at, at first, I think I'd, I'd been past it. Once, I, once it actually wasn't scary. I will say this: what was good because when I would go in with with um, with the purposes of just jamming. It's like, it's a total nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's like, cool, worst thing happens is you jam a song that you, that you don't connect with or you don't feel something has come, but it was so quick and so rewarding. Like it was very fast that, that we've got this sort of, this shared, I think this shared thing of like, okay, we're making something cool here. Let's, let's stick to it. Like it was intensely creative and intensely productive. And it was, it was, so it wasn't scary. It was like, this is something in some of those songs that, that, that didn't exist it before, and now we've all just summoned it into the space. And and I think once once I knew that I could, I had the freedom to make sure that the lyrics resonated with me, and I could I could sort of build that that part of the song, in my own time, in my own space. That really that that was everything to me, and, and um, that's how I always have written. So um, so in that regard, it wasn't scary, which is good. You've spoken about the literary influence on the album, like Dante's Inferno. Were they there from the start? Was that something that it, kind of inspired you right at the beginning? It was early, yeah. It was there early. And I think I was just like writing, or reading, I should say, some sort of like old poems, old poetry, that 
the free time in the pandemic allowed me the sort of mental space, the sort of the the time also to sit down and read stuff that I'd always sort of sort of like you know beat myself up over uh, being the college dropout that I am. That it's like okay, well, I never really sat down with these works, you know, and um, not that I would have studying music to be fair, but Inferno. Um, some stuff by Ovid, Metamorphosis, um, you know, some of these kind of epic poems, and just exploring those um, and, and their devices, they're sort of like, in the case of like Ovid, like like, the, the, like an epic simile, you know, like using, a sim like using a long, long simile, that kind of Homeric way of, of taking six, seven, eight lines to describe somebody trembling, you know. So yeah, so I remember there's some of these sessions, there's a song called Through Me, which was on the first EP that we released this year. I definitely just wanting to write stuff that had this kind of epic simile feel to it, just le le letting these sort of lines spill over. So that, that sort of found its way into the work. But, but with Dante, there's this line, above the door of hell, as he imagines it, I, he writes it, through me you enter into the population of loss. It says, through me you enter into the city of woe, you enter into eternal pain. <laughs> and through me you enter into the population of loss and something about that line to enter into the population of loss it just it's resonated with me given the moment that it was it was march or april 2020 and um, all these <clears throat> figures just numbers kind of being thrown at us every day this great risk of all of us having a, a great deal to lose not only personally but in our relationships and professionally also and, and um, that just resonated with me so that that's it's sort of but early on yeah a lot of the songs were like nearly too referenced the text way too much. It was kind of becoming I won't say too much, but it was becoming nearly musical theater. So, it was, but I but I always want I always wanted to. It was always there. There was always something there I wanted to to, to explore. You know. You said that one of the songs you're particularly proud of is um, "Butchered Tongue." Mm. What is it about that song that you're proud of? Because it's quite violent in its imagery, isn't it? People yeah, might be surprised. Yeah, it, it is. And it is, it's in the circle of violence, you know, appropriately enough. Um, I'd never put a voice to, and it's a, quite a particular experience of just traveling to different places you've never been before. And asking locals, let's say a place with an interesting place name that might have an indigenous root to it, and asking locals, you know, what is, it, what is the name? What, is, what does this place name mean? And, and no one being able to tell you. Um, what it means, and there's, it's it's very sad, and it's it, that that song tries to tries to hold in in one hand the reality of 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 that the the the, the actuality of, of of what that means uh, for the people who who once upon a time this was home to, but also the reality of who lives there now that this is just to be met by those locals with such generosity of spirit and and um, that this is the, this place means home to them. So it, it, it tries to hold in both hands uh, both of those things. Um, it's a very short song, but it's just like a poem set to music, I suppose. So, and it's, it's just not something I'd, I'd really explored before. How did the uh, joke of Brandy Carlyle come about? Yeah, I've known Brandy for, for a few years. We, um, I think we met in, in New, Newport Folk Festival years <laughs> ago. She's an incredible artist. She's an incredible singer, somebody I have huge respect and admiration for. And we, you know, become friends over the years, and and um, she's invited me into into such incredible experiences and, and spaces, and and um, but when I was writing it, I kind of knew the song was a, was always a duet. It was always, it, and her voice is just one of those voices. I kept hearing her voice in that song. It needed something that was soaring. It needed it needed a voice that was as powerful as Brandy, and there's not many singers that can, that have a voice like her. You know, she has this, she just has an incredible instrument on her hands. She has this incredibly courageous, um, the way she swings for notes, her voice is absolutely, you know, it's stratospheric, it totally soars. Um, I'd always heard her in that. So I shared it with her and in her yeah, in her grace and in her crazy schedule, she managed to to uh, to record to record uh, her parts on that from her studio in Seattle, um, or just outside Seattle. And um, yeah, it was great. It was great. I was delighted that we could get on that song together. Was it quite amazing when you, I guess, got her isolated vocal parts in your uh, inbox and just heard them without any music? Yeah, yeah, it was wild. We we did it. We did a remote session. So I was I was on, I was I was listening to her put it down, but to hear 
she at the time she she was just so giving and so she was like let me let me do a few more runs let me do a few more let me mm. do a few more sort of especially she would just try stuff just try harmonies just try different ad libs as well towards the end um and yeah every single time just absolutely just if she'd open her mouth and just knock it out of the park so it was really really exciting to just hear hear her in real time putting her vocals on on, on that track for the first time was was a really good feeling Another influence on the album Grunge, which we can hear in places. Were you was that something you listened to a lot growing up, or did you kind of explore it later? I am. Um, I did a little bit. I did a little bit. I remember in primary school. Yeah, Nirvana was the coolest thing <laughs> um, we could listen to, and I was a, like, even when I was ever ten or eleven, you know, in the, in the sort of late nineties and then early early two thousands. But um, I think it's something that it's like anything it's like an early formative sort of soundscape that sort of sits in you and i'd never explored sort of playing with that and song like francesca is a little bit of it in who we are um i'd never really just i never really played with it so and part of it also is being in a studio where you you have access to these beautiful amplifiers these beautiful uh toys these great guitars these great amplifiers and you just want to you just want to make noise you know <laughs> and um, so there is that too you know but it felt good to open that door yeah, yeah. yeah to experiment with it a bit yeah, yeah yeah you did a secret set at glastonbury earlier this summer and you've mm-hmm. also uh, you did a surprise kind of busking thing at Brighton for Pride. I was wondering, because you play such huge venues now, you've just done Alexander Palace, we've got arenas like this year. Is it mm-hmm. fun for you to do this kind of guerrilla gigs uh, it, here and there? It is, it really is. You've, and I think when you're doing them the first time around, I mean, they're not guerrilla gigs when you're doing them on the way up, yeah. as it were, you know? <laughs> yeah. they're, ex- they're, they're, fraught with, they're fraught with that thing of like, um, oh, I hope, I hope this works out, you know what I mean? This is my first time doing this club show or this iconic sort of grungy venue you know um so to come back especially when you feel a bit more established and you've got the kind of the ground is settled beneath your feet and um, it's super fun and then then it's just a party like it's like you're, you're just doing these kind of sweat boxes and um uh, but to do to do glastonbury we, we did a whole club run we did barry ballroom in the states recently we did like troubadour but yeah to come back and do something to just jump into to a tent in glastonbury and I mean, there's a little bit of nerves too because it's like everybody has a schedule for what they think they want to see that day. So to, to just jump in that day and go, hey, also I'm here. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of take a bit of a risk. But the, the tent failed quickly. We just had a party and it was, it was, a, good t- it was a good time. It feels good. And what about pitching up in Brighton City Centre for busking? Like, you, are you worried like, on some level that if no one turns up? Because it's not like when you're starting out and no one knows who you are. No, if yeah. not many people turned up, it's like it, yeah. you know, people would know. <laughs> yeah, the weather was shocking as well. Too, so we, we, did, we did play in, in torrential rain. No, it was good. It, it feels good. It's, it's, really, it's just really enjoyable. It's just a nice way to connect, and it does. It reminds you. It's something you get so used to doing when you're sort of starting out. Doing it again, it's nice to just use that muscle again, and you're you're kind of right on top of people, and and it does away with the conceit of of a show, you know what I mean, of a of a stage and an audience. You kind of just you're in space and you're playing a song, and, and people are, you could say there's still an audience, but there's just something about it's just very grounded. It's just very it's an it's an interaction, you know. Um, it's been nearly ten years since Take Me to Church. Near, I think a month of ten years. I was looking at the stats. I mean, it's just, it's wild. I think 2.1 billion Spotify streams. It's 12 times platinum in the States. I mean, I could go on with this, but like, do you, can you ever kind of fully process that level of success? Because it's phenomenal. Yeah, I think I'd stopped, uh, you know. Sorry for bringing up the stats. No, <laughs> not at all. No, I kind of just, I think you, you do, you stop looking at the, you kind of just check out of the numbers or something. And I, I also try not to like quantify to myself what a song has done or is based on its based on its like numer on its numbers you know what i mean it's kind of like uh, what what numbers it's done and um, like for me when i wrote it i was super proud of it and i've been incredibly proud that that song of, of everything mm-hmm. i've written was the one that was like this crossover hit and it was very it was an unusual popular crossover an unusual pop hit at the time an unusual sort of radio success but I'm proud of, 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 of anything that I've written, that it was that one. And I'm very happy that it was that one. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a gift. It's been a gift for me. And, and um, so, yeah, but I, I think there's some janit- internal janitorial work. It's just like stepping away from, from 
thinking about cluttering your head with okay did this you know what 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 number is it on now you know um it, it's um i'm just so grateful that it's connected in the way that it has you know well, I guess as a musician, whenever you put a song out there, it's kind of on some level, it's no longer just yours, it's for everyone. Exactly. And with that, it's just that on a kind of grand scale. Like, so many people must have, you know, connected with that song for so many different reasons. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's part, part of that is, 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 you know, you do, you let go of it and it becomes, it's accepted into the hearts of other people. And it's, either way, the listener always finishes a piece and they always bring their own experience to it. And I just, and that's... Taking to Church is a, is, a, is a song that has just been taken into a great deal of hearts and I think there's, what I've noticed is, is a new generation um, of people kind of showing up to shows and, and to meet and greets and stuff and they're, they, were, they were a child when the song came out and that's because that's it's put year, it puts years on me and they're like, they're like, hey, I was eight when this song came out or whatever. I'm like, no, no, that's what? But it, what's, what I'm, again, I'm really proud of is that it's like it seems to people connect to it and there's something maybe timeless in that song and, and in, in some ways it's more applicable to our world now than it mm. was when it came out. And I think that might be part of it too, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... Oh, yeah, I'm proud of it, yeah, for sure. But, yeah. Do you enjoy seeing people cover it? I always remember Demi Lovato did an amazing version of the Live Lounge where she really sang the shit out of it. She did. <laughs> I mean, she sings it way better than I can sing it, you know? I mean, she sings those, she, I mean, she's got notes for days. She's such a, um, <laughs> you know? Um, no, but she's that incredible voice and this incredible sort of um, range. And so, yeah, she's excellent, you know? She's, uh, it is, it's, 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 it's a really, it is a good feeling, you know? Um, it's... I think it's I think it's the highest honor when somebody's singing your work, and I don't just mean like an artist like Demi Lovato or you know, um, anybody. Yeah. I think anybody. I think that's the highest that's the highest praise. It, basically, the medium now is is becoming somebody else's body, somebody else's hands, somebody else's throat, and your work is living through them, and that is that's that is as good as it gets. I think you know. How do you say like the music industry's changed in the last ten years since you broke through? Like. Are you a fan of TikTok, for example? I can't say I'm a fan of TikTok, you know, but I, but I, you know, these things exist and they are, they're in, they are interesting in that they, that they, in, in how they develop and how people express themselves on them. Um, you know, there, there will be a next thing, there will be something else after this, but um, people for the first time are able to, in this little, in, in social media, are creating these moments that is, that they themselves can be viral, but they, they're taking from other viral um, places, other pieces of music mm. that, that resonates with them. It could be comedy, it could be, it could be music, it could be anything, it could be a line from a movie. Creating this thing, even in a fun way, even in a silly way, um, but creating something new out of it that resonates, that, that captures something of their experience, that captures something of... of, of, of of the world and how it resonates with them, and that's interesting. Mm. Um, uh, it's kind of like this little video comedy sample culture. You know what I mean? It's sampling pieces of culture to create something else, which is in turn is being referenced and creating something which will be used for creating something new. So that is interesting, um, and it's created a new platform where I think people have explored, have experienced my music in a new way. A new generation has, has, has discovered it and I'm finding that songs that I didn't think would, would get attention or get, get half the plays that they, they, they do are being discovered and, and shared and become viral years and years after yeah. the fact, which is interesting. Yeah. It feels like all bets are off, as you say, like a song that's eight years old can just suddenly have this moment. Totally. It's wild, really. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I welcome that. Yeah. Know, totally. so it just goes to show, like nowadays, you never really know what's going to be a hit in inverted commas. Because oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's wonderful. I think like artists, they put so much love and care oftentimes into, into, their, into the body of their work. And it's cool when somebody finds something that you, years ago, you're like, oh yeah, I, lo I, lo I remember making that, I loved it. And somebody else has, discovers that for a moment. And, and it's nice, it is nice. It's like, and it democratizes a little bit, I don't know, the, the, the enjoyment and creation of, of, mm. of something I know. But. Right from the start, you've spoken out on LGBTQ issues and recently trans rights issues in particular. What makes you want to use your voice in that way? Why is it important to you? I think the, there's, I've always just tried to, 
to be honest, I think it's really important in your work to be honest. Um, people talk about what an artist's responsibility is oftentimes, and that there's, I find that a hard question to, to tackle with in some succinct, definitive way. But um, I, think, I think you should at least try to be honest, and, um, which is what I've tried to do in the work. And so it, there's always been space in my work for just my own conscience and the way I view um, our responsibilities to a shared society that we live in. And, and, um, but also I'm, I'm acutely aware, increasingly aware, that there will, there's always a portion of the population who will become, uh, who are at risk of, of becoming a scapegoat when, when things get difficult and political leaders do not have easy answers um, for the enormous questions that they're faced with. Um, or even difficult answers, uh, which are oftentimes more important for the difficult uh, challenges that we all face. Um, with regard systems as they as they fail us and fail fail you know fail us collectively and so oftentimes the easiest thing to do is to hop on culture war issues is to hop on a scapegoat is to um, drum up uh, some fear mongering and, and um, the minorities in that society are, are, are invariably always going to be uh, the first um, to be to be targeted and. I think we're witnessing that increasingly with with the LGBTQ plus community, particularly, yeah, in, um, the trans community. Yeah, I think you can definitely say that with the trans community, they've become, become the focus of this so-called culture war. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. Which is quite frightening, really, because you know they just want to live live their lives and they're having to kind of justify their existence. That's it's, what it feels like. It's amazing, yeah. And again, you're, you're dealing we're dealing with less than maybe one percent of of the population, you know, and. and and if it's not, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's always a, por a portion of the population that it oftentimes, and if it's, or in the case of refugees or, 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 or you know, um, people who have um, the least amount of political representation, mm. the least amount of, of, of political power, and are oftentimes shouldered with the majority of the blame and yeah. uh, you know which is amazing yeah, arithmetic is done somewhere and then <laughs> we you know we've a bunch of newspaper articles and, and primetime pieces about yeah that sort of shoulder all this blame onto onto the tiniest portion of the population it's amazing and there'll be yeah as you say like a primetime piece on tv about some some trans issue and there won't be one trans person asked to come and speak about 100%. it that's when you when you see that you're like yeah yeah it's incredible it really is it's becoming grimly predictable, mm. um, but it's uh, yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. What do you see your purpose as a mu musician as being? I don't know. I've, <laughs> I've, 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 I think it's like it's really for me. All I can say is that I just hope, like all I can do is approach the work and approach the art in a way that that is honest as best I can. I. I intend to make work that I that I hope, at least in in the moment of its making, is worth is worth making, uh, that I find beautiful or worthwhile, and if people enjoy it and resonate with that, you know that's a gift. And I've been very fortunate in that in that respect. But I think, um, I think it's kind of a question is beyond me as to what my purpose is, you know. Um, but I, I try to keep it simple as far as you know, as far as my relationship with the work and. and my need to make it, um, and I, I hope that people resonate with it, you know. To an outsider, you seem like a pretty private person. Mm. Um, is that something you've worked hard to maintain? Or do you, is it just you going about your life in the way you, yeah. you can consider natural and it's me projecting the word private yeah. onto you? I, yeah, no, I, I am a private person, I think, um, but I haven't had to work hard. Hmm. I think we, you know, people work hard to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> they do, you know, like you know, there's a lot of when you see people taking photographs of so and so was here and there and what, like people people work hard to cultivate mm. a public persona, and um, I just I don't have to do that. I mean, but I don't want to do that. So I'd never be presumptuous as to, you know people would want to know anything about me, and I'm delighted to that they they, you know, I'm delighted that people enjoy the work and that they know me on the basis of the work. But I, there's no reason for anybody to know me. Aside from that, you know, and so yeah, I think yeah, people people go to great lengths to be famous. I, 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 you know, you really don't have, you know. So I, I don't. I actually don't work hard to be private at all. I I share what I think is appropriate to the work or what's appropriate to share, and 
you know, I think the reason why I don't post all that much on social media is actually just more a mental health thing. It's an, it's an internal janitorial uh, well-being thing, you know. I feel better when I just live in the here and now. And um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't have to work too hard at it. Is that something you realised over time, like early in your career, did you post more on social and have you become less kind of prolific? I think, yeah. I think so, I think so. Um, part of that is just, is just realising, it's like anything, like, you know, this, this, isn't, this doesn't serve me, this doesn't serve my well-being. Um, and it, it, social media has also become increasingly polarised and it's become a, a ground for culture war, you know, in a way that's mm. increasingly corporately funded. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it was always, you could say, but it's, you know, there's, there's, it's where a lot of sort of um, yeah, it's it's just it's it's there's it's some some spaces have have taken a turn recently and um, but I think I think I probably did I think when I was younger it was more just a playful thing and it's much lower stakes as well too and you're kind of and you don't have an audience of yeah. of, of maybe millions and and you share a bit more of your life and and you realise that that I don't know you just it just the interest leaves you. You kind of you value your quiet time. You know, I think I, I think I, I am a private person, but I give a huge amount of like I do reveal a huge amount of myself in, mm. in, in the songs and in the work in the, in an interview like this. You know, most people don't <laughs> most people don't sit down. You know, for an ME and do a chat. You know what I mean? Talk about themselves. Yeah. yeah. So in, in in respect, you know, with in that respect, I you know I, I'm I'm plenty public. You know? <laughs> <laughs> plenty public enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It's been thank really you. fun. Thank Cheers. you. It was great. Thank time. You.